Ray and Gladys are sitting back there. So if you'd like to be the first ones to go say hi to Ray and Gladys, you get that opportunity. The rest of us, let's introduce ourselves to one another in Christ's love. As you're making the way back to the pew in which you're seated, hopefully you'll stop and pick up the Ritual of Friendship pad. It should be at one end or the other. You may see some names from the early crowd. They send you greetings, and we'd love to know that you were with us today. So please pass that down. Going down the list of things today, Reverend Sarah is not down front with us today because she is back in Ohio today. She was invited to go back and baptize her nephew, and she's also preaching today at her home church. So pray for her as she goes back for that return. Hopefully it's a wonderful day for them. And that means that I needed help down here, so Emily Snyder, our Director of Student Ministries, will be the liturgist today. So Emily, thank you. Oh, let's clap for Emily. And Jeremy was our liturgist at the early service. They didn't clap for him either, and you know how Jeremy is, so let's clap for him. And I thank the Booth folks and everybody that helps make worship the special thing it is here at church. Last Sunday, we celebrated Super Bowl Sunday with the nation, but also the Super Bowl of caring. And I will tell you that it was a very intriguing game. If you've never played 18 on 18 flag football, you haven't lived. So, um, in the midst of all that chaos, the geezers went out to a two-touchdown lead early on. The youth tied it up in the second half, and with four minutes left, the geezers pushed in a touchdown, and so they won the game. So, the trophies, now, as I've told you before, the real winners are this. You all, last week, donated $776 in the soup pots. That is going straight to Family Emergency Services Salvation Army. Their cupboards are pretty bare right now. So that money is going to go straight over there. Plus, the collection of canned goods continues through this month. So next week when you come to church, bring your canned goods. We have three huge tubs down there, and I think we will be taking several hundred cans of canned goods too. So Super Bowl of Caring, I'm sure as a nation, over $5 million was raised this year, and our tally will go into that, so we really celebrate. So thank you all for your support of that. Yesterday, our soup kitchen ministry continued feeding hungry people every Saturday since we started in 2004. T. Michael Stavros was our head cook, and that means that he got to recruit his family and friends and some other folks in the congregation. They fed 75 hungry people yesterday, and all those folks came back through, so they had I think 140 servings total, so a wonderful day. Our friends from Hope Presbyterian Church are the soup kitchen head cooks. They're doing this next week. We have one open date between now and the middle of May on the soup kitchen calendar. So if you want a head cook, go downstairs or call in and we'll put you on that date. The April 1, April 8 dates have great head cooks but could use some help. So if you'd like to join a great team, you can join that. And we're just excited that we're able to do so much feeding in ministry. Um, today at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a gathering in McLeod Hall for anybody who wants to hear more about our Honduras mission trip. Um, we have been praying really hard the last three years, and the way is clear for us to return to Honduras. We're going in June. It's a week-long trip. We're going to leave on June 12th. It's a Monday. We're going Monday to Monday. It is open for anybody 
that has completed ninth grade and above. So if you'd like to come and be a part of that, we would love to have you join us. Four o'clock downstairs, showing up to the meeting doesn't mean you've committed to the trip. It just means you'd like to hear more about it. And the commitment comes in about 10 days after that because we've got to get some airline tickets. But pray for us, four o'clock today for anybody interested in hearing more about Mission Honduras this summer. At 5.30 downstairs, the Chosen Bible Study, we're in season three and we'd love to have you join us. We do a covered dish meal. We always have plenty of food. So if you're a first timer, you don't have to cook anything. Just come and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, you don't have to have watched the episodes. We'll watch an entire episode tonight, and then we'll have some time to discuss the biblical influence behind The Chosen. So come and join us for that. This week, oh, Tuesday is Shrove Tuesday. So at 5.30, we'll have our pancake supper. It's the feast before the fast. So we get rid of all the leaven in our house and in our church before we start Lent. So come and join us for a wonderful time. Be about an hour long, there'll be pancakes, sausage, you're gonna have a chance to make your own Mardi Gras mask. We will have a pancake race also, so come out and join us. Or if you just wanna come have great fellowship, you can do that too. 6.30 on the next night, Ash Wednesday, we'll have the service of ashes here in the sanctuary, and that's Ash Wednesday, is the official start of Lent. So come and join us, we will have time to confess our sins, we will symbolically burn those confessions, and you'll have a chance to be marked with ashes that come from last year's ashes. And so come and join us for that, if you will. And next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent, and so we'll be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We hope you'll prepare yourselves to come to the table next Sunday with us. Today is our third Sunday of the month, which is our three cents a meal hunger offering Sunday. And I do see a couple grandchildren, great-grandchildren in the congregation. Are they gonna be able to help me, Lauren? Perfect. So if they'll come down and get a basket, and I'll take a basket, and Emily and young Jeremy, if you'd help us as three penny partners. You play the song. Never mind, Emily, it's you. I guess that would be young Karen. So <laughs> we'll do it. So let's get our basket. Oh, Coot's always game. Come down. What we do is we take up three pennies every time at home that we eat a meal and we bring them together for our hunger offering. So our younger disciples are coming. Pick any basket you would like. Perfect. And we do have the three penny partner song. I understand Jeremy plays that. And so as you'll hear that played, join us. If you've got money for the hunger offering, just signal and one of our partners will come and take that from you. Let us now continue our worship, our preparation for worship as we present our hunger offering. Thank you, Karen.
Good morning. Please, please join me in the call to worship. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that we may proclaim the excellence of the one who called us out of darkness and into light. Let us rejoice in God's grace as we worship God. The grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you have claimed, redeemed, and saved us. As followers of our Lord, you have called us to live lives that show your righteousness, mercy, and love. We confess, though, that we are often poor reflections of Christ's presence within us. Forgive us for failing to spend the time we should in reading your word and listening for your voice to us in prayer. Forgive us for claiming to love you while withholding kindness and charity from our neighbors. Forgive us for the ways that we judge those around us while turning a blind eye to our own selfishness and sinfulness. Mold and make us into true disciples who wish to learn from and lean on our Lord each day, as even now we worship and pray. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Amen.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Freely you have received, freely give. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through, the, through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. 
Use us in what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the young people together to come down front and join me for our time with younger disciples. our Honduran baskets out today because it's three cents a meal Sunday and we've talked about three cents a meal off and on over times so we talk about how this money has helped us have a soup kitchen and a bag lunch ministry how it also helps us to feed migrant farm worker families over near Tampa at a place called Bethel which is our church our presbytery's mission to migrant farm workers and then one of our pennies that we collect out of every three goes to Honduras so I want us to look for a minute at baskets. And I asked the people at the first service why they chose a particular basket and the different young people said they often choose it for the color. So when we're in Honduras, we try to pick colorful baskets. That one's pretty cool. This one, when you get a little distance, looks like a star, doesn't it? And then there's this one, and this one. There's actually one that I keep in my office that I was there when we bought it years ago, and it looks like a butterfly, and it's the butterfly basket. And every time I go to Honduras, I look for another one and haven't found one yet. So that one stays a little close to me right now, but those are cool baskets. I want to tell you that because the baskets are a part of what we do that remind us about Honduras. And then I want to show you some pictures. <coughs> We've got a meeting downstairs this afternoon, and so we've got some photo boards to help people. There are some pictures on here from our very first church trip to Honduras. It was in 1998. Now remind me when you all came into the world. What year were you born? 2012. 2013. What year were you born, honey? 2017. So nobody in the front row remembers 1998. <laughs> 1998's first time we sent people from our church to Honduras. Now at the early service, I was able to show the McKee boys that right there in the middle of that pickup truck was their mom, before she was their mom. She was in the truck, but when we looked around, we saw that we see pictures of grown-ups and children. Right here is a little child in Honduras who was watching this group dig a footer for the education building for the church. Right there is a man named Gene Aspie, and Mr. Aspie had some candy he was sharing with that little child. When we go to Honduras, we see adults and we see lots of children. This one is the last trip our church made to Honduras right before the pandemic. This was 2018. And again, when you look at the pictures there, you see adults. And then if you look at that corner up there, you see lots of children. When we go to Honduras, we go with dentists like Dr. Ecclesheimer, And with doctors, we have Honduran doctors there and nurses from here. And we go to villages a lot of times and we set up clinics so people can come visit the dentist and the doctor. Now when that happens, if there are... 50 adults that are wanting to see the doctor, that might mean that there would be 150 people came with that family because most of those families have children. And so if children are waiting to see the doctor or especially if their parents are, there are other children that need to be entertained. And so what we do is we spend a lot of time playing with children in Honduras so their families can visit the doctor. Then I had another one, and if I'd known you all were going to be here today, I would have picked the right board, but I don't think your mom is in, she is in this one. 
Aha, I see your great grandmother's name in here. And yes, this is 2009. And on this trip, we went and we did medical and we also set up clinics and we helped build. And you'll see again, lots of children. So if you look real close in there, and if you looked in this picture right there, you would see your mom, Lauren Hobgood, is one of those. You have to have better eyes than I do. Let me get my glasses out. Maybe we can help on this one. And you'll see Barbara Perkins in there. Can you see him anywhere? Do you see mom or great-grandmother in any of the pictures? Look around at different ones and we'll try to find them but I know they're in this big group right there. I promise. Well, well, we'll look a little closer afterwards. We'll let them come down and find them. But this is a trip. And on this mission trip, we painted, we played, we helped with medical, and we saw lots of children. I told you we're going to go back to Honduras this year. It's been a long time. We went down in 2020 and we planned a whole week long trip out in January of 2020. And we were going to go back in June that year. And then there was a pandemic and then travel was closed down. And until this year, it hasn't been possible for us to go back, but we're going. And when we go, we're going to have adults and youth go from here. And we're going to spend a lot of time with the adults and especially the children in Honduras. So we're going to ask you all to pray with us as we get ready for that trip. And my hope is that one of these days, you all might even think about going with us to Honduras and joining us on one of the trips. So let's fold our hands and bow our heads and talk to God in prayer. God, we thank you that you call us by name and you give us all mission and ministry to do. I thank you for the young people in the church today who've helped us to collect money so that we can build churches in Honduras and we can feed the children in those churches in Honduras. I thank you, God, for the mission team that right now is dreaming about a trip, and I ask you to bless us as we plan that trip. Help us as a congregation to join together in making sure that the gospel is being spread around the world and that we can partner with our friends in Honduras in that task. Now watch over us, and as we grow, Help us to see where we can help, how we can be obedient disciples. We ask you to watch us and bless us as we keep following Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming today and helping us, and pray for us if you will, and we'll talk to you later. Friends, let us now continue in a season of prayer as we turn to God with the prayers of God's people. Loving God, as we gather in this house today, we praise you for your blessings upon our lives and for the ability to gather in this house for worship. God, as we come here today, we thank you for the generations of folks before us who have provided not only this place here, but this blessed country in which we live. We thank you for those who served in our military and cared so much about our freedom that they would risk their own lives and their own freedom at times. God, we thank you for those who continue to provide a secure place for us, those who work in security and safety, those emergency responders who put their lives on the line regularly so that we might have all that we have. God, as we gather in your house today, we also thank you for the call that we have felt in our individual lives. Jesus called people throughout the scriptures by name, and we hear his words echo in this place, and we hear his call come to each of us. God, I thank you for the young people who have heard Jesus' call and have responded. I thank you for people across the age spectrum 
who have devoted their lives as disciples and who continue to offer their gifts in helping us praise you and serve you. God, as we gather here today, we thank you for all those who went before and we thank you for this moment in which we live, an opportunity to come to worship and serve you. God, at this time, we also pray for people who could not join us in this place. We pray for those who this day are confined to hospitals, to their own homes, to rehab facilities and nursing homes. God, we ask you to bless people now as people around them offer care, compassion, and love. God, we ask you to be with those who could not join us because they are incarcerated. We also pray for those who are traveling at this time for business or pleasure. We ask you to be with those who are working at this moment so we can enjoy this place. For the utility workers, for those who work in public safety, for those who work in the hospitality industry and will have a meal on the table when we arrive after church. God, we ask you to be with the health care workers. We ask you to be with all those who find that this morning they are called to service in this world. God, as we gather here today, we also pray for people in our own country and around the globe who have not heard the call to be your people. We ask you to reach out through our words and our actions to them so they can see the joy that is found in knowing Jesus Christ. God, we pray for Christians around the world who are not free to assemble for worship, for people in places where persecution does persist. We ask you to watch them, protect them, and guide them. And God, we ask you to be with our mission partners around the world. Today, we remember the church in Honduras and we pray for our friends there. For the 30 congregations that proclaim the good news of what you've done for us in Jesus Christ, who show love and compassion to their community, who help to educate children in faith, and who help adults to live their lives faithfully. God, as we gather here, we pray for the world in which we live. The news is not always pleasant. We pray for those who have been afflicted by natural disasters and for also calamities. We pray for those who are in the midst of war-torn situations. We pray for those who live in violence in their neighborhoods or their own homes. God, we ask you to be with people, ar ask you to be with people around the world and help our compassion and care to extend to them. God, as we come today to consider stories of people with a past and all of us with a promise of a future, we help us to let go of the things that bind us down and help us to accept following Jesus as our call. We thank you for the saving grace of our Lord. We thank you for his presence among us even now. And we join and pray as he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture lessons today are going to come to us throughout the Gospels, but I would invite you to turn in the Bible that you brought from home or the Bible that you'll find in the pew for our first two scriptures. I'll begin today in Luke chapter 8. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen now for God's word to us. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Turning then to the Gospel according to Matthew, to chapter 27, in verse 55, we find this. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, 
and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a woman named Mary Magdalene who was an early follower of Jesus. She's been depicted a variety of ways throughout the years. This picture is a picture from that book that I showed the children last week called Jesus Love Them. It's a guidepost publication from 1957 that my grandmother used to use to share stories with me and my sister. Back in 57, this is one of the ways that the editor of that book helped us to imagine Mary Magdalene. Now I hate to tell you, I don't have a needlepoint coat of arms or a shield on Mary Magdalene from the Price Library like I have with many of the other disciples. And we don't have a wooden bust among the 12 wooden busts that often hang in our reference library, at least one depicting Mary Magdalene. There are, however, lots of images of Mary Magdalene in the Chosen film series. She's one of the first people that we meet and we learn her story as a follower of Jesus. We meet Mary Magdalene about a third of the way through the Gospel according to Luke in the words that I just shared a few minutes ago. Soon afterward, Jesus went on through one town and one village after another, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. As we expected, the twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who ministered to them out of their resources. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There were others that were mentioned in the scriptures. Matthew, the tax collector. Judas, always referred to as the one who betrayed Jesus. And then there's Mary Magdalene. Her story also comes with some baggage. We meet Mary Magdalene like this. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. That's Luke's introduction for us. The Gospel writer Mark was also familiar enough with that story that in what is called the third ending of Mark, the longer ending, in chapter 16, we find these words. Now after Jesus rose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were still mourning and weeping. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You see how the story is unfolding? There was a woman named Mary Magdalene who was an early follower of Jesus. And Mary Magdalene was a follower of Jesus for the long haul. Again, this morning in our first two scripture lessons, we heard mention of Mary Magdalene. Then it was chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel. Right there near the end of the gospel in the story of the death of Jesus on the cross, Matthew says, Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. You see, friends, it was Mary Magdalene and not Susanna. It was Mary Magdalene and not Thaddeus, not Andrew, not Simon the Zealot. But it was Mary Magdalene who is present in the end story of Jesus and in all the gospel accounts of his resurrection. Listen, if you will, to how the scriptures consider the greatest news of all. We'll start in Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. 
For fear of him, the guards shook, and they became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's been raised, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. That's what we find in Matthew chapter 28. Now, listen to the stories it's recorded in Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And they entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified? He's been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Listen to the story from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found that stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified on the third day, rise again? They remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, and he was amazed by what had happened. And then turning to John's Gospel, chapter 20. Beginning with verse 11, it says, But Mary stood outside the tomb... As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Friends, all of this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go back to the beginning. There was a woman named Mary Magdalene who was an early follower of Jesus. She and some other women provided for Jesus and his companions out of their resources. Mary Magdalene was there from time to time along the dusty roads of Palestine in the three years of Jesus' public ministry. 
She also watched from a distance as her Lord was nailed to the cross and died. That day she took courage and followed to make sure that she knew the place where they had laid his body. And then at sunrise on Easter Sunday, she brought spices with the other women to prepare his body for a decent burial. And if we read on in the story, she was probably there as this resurrected Jesus helped to start his church. In Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, the story continues. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. It was Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you look at the Bible, Mary Magdalene was listed by name in so many places. She's listed among the faithful because if anyone was faithful, she was. And she was faithful because she had been forgiven. We meet her as Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Now, you can look pretty deep into the Bible, and you will not find it spelling out specifically what those demons were. Sadly, that hasn't stopped commentators over the centuries from assigning specific demons to Mary. Now, when I read their words, I am a little suspicious that the demons they are giving to her may in fact be their own demons assigning to her stumbling blocks that they had found in the faith. The Bible does one thing, however. It shows us the faith of this woman whose life had been marked by forgiveness. And her faith was incredibly strong. She was there near the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. She was there in the middle of his public ministry. She was there at the end of his public ministry and she was there to witness the resurrected Jesus as he gave birth to the church of Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, we know about Mary Magdalene's faith. We know that she had been rescued from seven demons and we know that this incredible life was based on a forgiven woman showing us that her demons did not dissuade her from answering the call to follow Jesus. When I think about Mary Magdalene, I think about a life that was really about overcoming, putting things in her past so that her future could be dedicated to following her Lord. A little bit later in the Bible, when we get out of the Gospels, we come across the story of a man named Saul. Saul was a great hater of the newly formed church of Jesus Christ. Saul was confronted by the risen Jesus himself on a road one day. And after that encounter, his name was changed to Paul. And after he met Jesus face to face, he became one of the great apostles of the church. Paul was a man with a past. Paul was a man with an incredible future. Like Mary, Paul was another flawed, forgiven, oh, so faithful follower of Jesus. Paul talked to other people about his past, about their present, and about the future that we shared. And Paul, from time to time, would talk about some of those stumbling blocks He wrote one time to the church in Colossae. And as we read the story, I wonder if maybe Saul, Paul, was talking about the stumbling blocks from his life as he told them to avoid some things. Colossians 3, beginning with verse 5, Paul writes, Put to death, death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, 
evil desire and greed, which is idolatry, he says. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you were counting there, but there were more than seven destructive habits listed just in that brief letter to the Colossians. I don't know if you were noting them. Some of those demons might be your own. Were there some behaviors there that are keeping you or me from freely following Jesus? Paul mentioned sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Paul mentioned greed, and before we dismissed it, he said, that's actually idolatry. He mentioned anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive language. Now, friends, this is only a sampler. Paul and other prophets will list a whole lot more behaviors that may be stumbling blocks for those people who are trying to follow Jesus. But as we read them, all those things that might seem like roadblocks to a deep and abiding faith are things that we can overcome with God's help. And then we can put them in our past. Mary Magdalene was forgiven and freed from seven demons in her pathway of discipleship. And this forgiven soul, Mary, lived a joyous life in faith. She met the Lord. She loved the Lord. She followed the Lord so closely and loved him so deeply that when she thought his body had been taken away, she volunteered to go find it and carry it herself to a proper place for burial. That's Mary. That's faith. And she started out needing to have seven demons cast out. We're involved in a sermon series called Follow Me. And as we think about following Jesus more closely, we can look at Paul. We can look at the 12, like Matthew the tax collector, Thomas the hard sell, and Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Friends, let's celebrate that there is nothing so bad in our lives that Jesus can't love us and call us by name. There's nothing so daunting in who we are or what we might be choosing to hide right now that Jesus can't pull us right from that. And let's hear the invitation to live the best life possible, the life that's offered in faith. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about a guy named Abraham as an example of faith. Abraham is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great witnesses of a faithful life. Well, listen to the invitation that comes to all of us from Hebrews chapter 12. Since therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured this as you live on. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Mary Magdalene, for being one of those great witnesses showing us the way to live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to help us to conclude our worship in praise as we turn to hymn 441, Hear the Good News of Salvation. Please stand if you're physically able. Let's praise God together. Salvation, Jesus Christ. 
Gospels are an incredible book of snapshots, especially of the life of Mary Magdalene. We find this person who's first described as somebody from whom seven demons had to be cast out. But by the end of the story, we see in every resurrection appearance, faithful, forgiven Mary standing there as an example of what we should do. Your own life may have some snapshots that you'd like to bury in an old book. Go ahead and bury them. That's called forgiveness and forgetting. And then, friends, you find the one of you as a faithful follower and go ahead and frame that one. Let's let the past be the past in our lives of faith. Let's let the future be what God intends. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.